Episode 2 of True Detective Night Country has just been released, and with this slightly longer episode than last week, the case focused on the dead scientists definitely had the room to breathe, which allowed the complexities to be established and fleshed out. With its connection to Annie's murder becoming more and more clear, the link to the ability to be able to see the dead, Clark being the main suspect due to him being missing, the doodles and the meaning of the notes, and the backstories of all of the other characters, Let's jump into this video and break down all that there was to take away from this episode. Here is True Detective Night Country Season 4 Episode 2 Ending Explained. Just to let you know, this video will contain spoilers. The ending, the symbol, and the development of the case. As we embarked onto the ending of this episode, all roads were pointing to Mr. Howard Clark in being the main suspect of the murders of the scientists especially considering that his body wasn't amongst the dead when they were defrosting on the ice ring. The entire episode was spent looking into the history of the character with the intention of finding out if there was any suspicious activity, and there definitely was. The main revelation in this episode was that he was in some kind of relationship with Annie, the person who was brutally murdered, which was a case that was never solved, and Evangeline previously worked on it. We don't know if they were together in a loving way, but we know that they were together intimately. This was due to the photo that he had on his phone which had the both of them together. On one of the bodies of the scientists, there was a symbol that was drawn on their forehead. What was interesting about this symbol is that when Rose drew it in the snow to see if Evangeline saw it, she mentioned how it was a symbol that was older than Ennis, and it could even be older than the ice itself. What else caught my eye about this was the fact that the moment that she showed Evangeline it, she wiped it away in a rush, as if to imply that it was some kind of bad omen. The symbol that was on the forehead of one of the bodies was a symbol that was also on Annie before the time of her death, as was seen in the photo. And following her death, four days after, Clark got the tattoo inked on his chest. One could only assume that he did it in some kind of tribute to her. The tattoo artist also said that he was crying after it was done most likely in the memory of Annie as he cared for her. When looking at the symbol, there is a common theme, death and fear. Annie had the tattoo on her and she was brutally murdered. It was put on a dead body. Clark had it on his chest and went insane. Plus, when Rose drew the symbol, she brushed it away as soon as possible. I wonder if the symbol has some kind of supernatural connection, hence Rose's adamant nature of washing it away. Right at the end of the episode, following it being revealed that Clark had a trailer that he bought that he'd used to meet Annie in so that they could get it on together, Evangeline discovered it in the trailer park completely covered in snow. However, it was what was inside of it which was the most interesting thing. Just before they entered, there was a scene where Liz was looking through his work, and she found pages where he'd written some notes on which tied back to the ominous She's Awake that we heard all throughout the first episode. The writing read things like, I can hear her coming, never say her name, her cold fingers, always remember, dark, dark eyes coming. Then on the next page, the phrase, oh god, never sleep, took the main focus as it also had drawings of what could only be described as the dark eyes that he was mentioning. So connecting Clark in the first episode where he was having that random fit when he was standing up, the paperwork and what I'm about to mention next showed that there was clearly something going on inside of his head. Within Clark's trailer, the same words were written all over the cupboards and the walls. Annie's phone was there, something which wasn't found at the crime scene when she was killed, and it was an absolute mess. There were animal bones, dirt, and filth everywhere. However, upon the ceiling, there was a giant drawing of the symbol, and laying on the bed, there was the shape of a body made out of cloth and fabric surrounded by photos of Annie with himself, almost like some kind of shrine for her. I wonder if Clark is connected to what Rose said earlier on in the episode. We heard Rose say that there were people that had the same ability as what she had, which was the ability to be able to see the dead, something she only discovered that she could do following Travis dying. However, she said that there were a lot of people that were out there that had the ability. She said that the dead either come to visit you, to tell you something, or to take you with them. I feel Clark could potentially be seeing Annie and she could be doing one of those things. Judging by the way that Travis looked, it seems like the way that you die, it's how you appear. So what if Annie is coming back to Clark and she looks how she did following the murder? Hence why he's traumatized by what he's seeing. Could Annie's appearance have unearthed a darker entity too? So if it's not Annie, could somebody have found passageway to Clark and they could be trying to take him? Hence the fear that he has. It's only a theory at the moment, but it's one that I think does have some kind of legs. With there being one survivor who didn't freeze to death, 
I'm intrigued to see what he has to say, if he does make it, that is. With the clothes being perfectly folded up at a distance, away from the bodies, with Clark not being there and him being connected to both Annie and now this case, it feels like he could be the person that's responsible for what's going on. Let's also remember the last time that we saw the scientists alive, Clark turned around and said, she's awake, before acting a bit strange. The death of Annie is something which is heavily connected to the death of the scientists, there's no denying it. With Annie's tongue also being found there, it makes it even more connected. All of the information that was missed in Annie's case is most probably going to be surfaced in this one because of the connection to Clark. So it's going to be interesting to see where it's going to go. Rose's connection to the dead. Within this episode, we found out more about why Rose could see the dead and more specifically, Travis. It was revealed that Travis was sick and he made the decision that he was going to choose when to die and he didn't want to let the illness take him. So one day, he got out of his bed and walked onto the ice and essentially froze to death. I think that's why we saw him with no shoes on and no jacket on, because that is how it was when he left for the final time. Travis was Rose's partner, and she said that following his death, she was able to see him. As I mentioned earlier, Rose said how the dead return because they want one of three things. With Travis, it feels like he visits Rose because he wants to tell her things, and in the first episode, it was to lead her to the bodies which are out on the ice. I imagine we're going to see more of this ability getting used throughout the season, as one would assume that Travis would have seen what occurred when on the ice, so he might point her in the direction of other things. It seemed as though Evangeline found Travis when he was out on the ice as well, which brought Rose and Evangeline together and to become friends. Liz's Flashback Within this episode, like last week, where we had a small section of a flashback, we had the same thing this time. We saw that Liz was lying on the floor with a young child, presumably Leah, and they were playing with the polar bear teddy that we've seen a couple of times throughout the season in its two episodes. The song Twist and Shout was playing in the background, which links back to the very beginning of the first episode where Liz was erratically trying to turn off the TV in the Salal Research Center where it was stuck on loop. So this is something which is definitely a bad memory for her. That young child could well have been Leah, or it could have been another child. We know that Liz was in a happy relationship with Leah's father due to the other flashback that we got where she was dancing with him. Leah reflected on the fact that Liz actually used to be more fun and laid back when compared to now. However, we know that there were periods of turbulence during their relationship, as we heard Liz say to Captain Connolly that they had many breaks. So I do wonder what happened there. When connecting it to the flashback in the first episode, we saw Liz walking towards something, Something which I'm presuming is the crime scene of where Leah's father was killed. So I'm guessing this flashback was taking place on the day of his death, maybe before she got the phone call. Hence the panic to turn the song off in the present day, due to it being associated with bad memories. So I feel as the episodes go on, that's something that will be getting developed more and more. We don't know how he died, or even if he is actually dead, but the way that Liz is acting and the nature of the flashbacks, it seems like that is the case. Navarro's flashback Within this episode, we saw Evangeline having her share of flashbacks too. She found a necklace in her car which belonged to her mother, and we saw a scene take place where it looked like her mother was mentally ill. Evangeline was comforting her sister, and it seemed as though her mother was having an episode. This was before she threw the necklace out of the car in the present day. Rose mentioned how communicating with the dead mustn't be confused with mental illness, and this was specifically said about Evangeline's sister, as she said that she heard voices and believed that people were following her. We also heard her sister say that she wasn't like their mum when Evangeline asked her to go to the lighthouse, which seems like some kind of facility that can help people if they're struggling. With it seeming like Evangeline is going to be going on to have some kind of her own mental health struggles and believing that she's seeing things, I wonder if her past trauma is going to be connected to that, and maybe she's more similar to her mother than she realizes, and it's not just her sister. Other important details Some other important moments in this episode were focused around Liz's underlying racism that she has. She expressed it towards Evangeline in the previous episode, and she also expressed it in this week's episode, where Leah had some temporary tattoos placed on her face. Tattoos which aligned with her heritage, and Liz told her to wipe them off immediately. And as well, this is something that's also present amongst the town of Ennis. There seems to be a clear divide between people. There's also a divide between the mining people and the people that are against it. It seems to be damaging some parts of the town, people's homes, ability to live, and ruining their lives. Liz and Captain Connolly have history. 
They've been sleeping with each other for nearly 19 years, and he was the person who decided to move her out to Ennis and to lead the police force there. It sounded as though something went on which resulted in her needing to be moved there, so I imagine that's something that's going to be developed as the season goes on. Pete's struggles are something which I think are also going to be developing more as the episodes progress. He wants to be there for his family, provide for them, and also be present. But work is something that seems to be colliding with it and causing him to not see them. With Kayla, his partner, getting increasingly frustrated with it and her feeling as though he's choosing work over his family, I feel he's going to find himself in a difficult predicament as he himself also said that he didn't want to end up like Navarro and be demoted, as it seems like his loyalties lie solely with Liz at the moment. With regards to Hank, there's definitely something strange going on with the woman that he's supposedly going to be marrying. I don't know whether she's just using him for money as he's sending her money over, and he's also sending photos of himself from when he was a bit younger, so it's definitely a confusing one. Overall review I thought this episode was really good. In fact, it was so much better than the first episode and I thought that was a great one. I thought it developed the case well while still keeping the mystery at the forefront. Seeing Pete and Liz in the flow of trying to ask the right questions to find out answers was a moment that I really enjoyed watching too. I thought the supernatural element of this season was going to be a bit questionable, but so far they've done it in a way which is actually quite chilling to watch and it doesn't feel cheesy or corny in the slightest, so I'm impressed by that. The way that this season looks is so fitting for the environment and the tone that they're going for. The show feels so glossy, almost like that shine you get on a glacier of ice, and it's allowing the coldness of the environment to be able to cut through. The harsh, hostile, sub-zero temperatures are something which I feel whilst watching it. I think Jodie Foster as Liz is a great casting, and I also think that Carly Reese is great too. In fact, all of the characters feel really well cast and are delivering extremely convincing performances, which is good to see. With the trailer for episode 3 being released, I'll aim to get a breakdown of that out as soon as possible with my theories on what I think will happen next. So, there you have it. True Detective Night Country Season 4 Episode 2 Ending Explained